As a covenantal faith tradition, covenants are the way in which we practice our religion together. They are aspirational descriptions of how we want to be in the world. Please join me as we recite BUC's covenant together, affirming that we as a congregation agree to as part of the BUC community, I promise to strive to be my best self in all interactions, assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity in my communications, pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Thus do we covenant with one another. <coughs> delight to have the weather this morning and to have that beautiful peace. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. I am happy to see you here and we are happy to be together and what a wonderful morning we're going to have. It is good to be together again, whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, remotely via Zoom, or watching this recording later. It's good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between our online and our sanctuary participants. We will project the image of folks who are currently on Zoom in their jammies, 
up here on our screen and ask them to turn their cameras on and give us a wave. Thank you. I see familiar faces there. Now we who are gathered in person will turn to face the camera in the back of our sanctuary and give them a wave. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, or in the world, every day we are building Birmingham Unitarian Church. And we are building a beloved community. If you are a guest with us, how welcome you are today. And what a special event for us to have you here. We are going to have coffee in our social hall to the left of the uh, sanctuary afterward. And we want to have you have coffee with us or not have coffee with us, but please come back and share with us. Tell us your name and all about yourself. We want to know you. This morning's service is being brought to you by the Racial Justice Committee. So each of us will share today. We light our flaming chalice to illuminate the world that we seek. In the search for truth, may we be just. In the search for justice, may we be loving. And in loving, may we find peace. May you stand uh, and, or as you are able, uh, to sing our first hymn, which is We Would Be One, number 318 in the hymnal, or it's on the screen. Racial Justice Committee is leading worship this morning with a special person in connection to BUC. Oh, that's me, sharing her professional innocence work. 
<laughs> the causes and consequences of wrongful convictions with the focus on race, I'm presenting the connection to Unitarian Universalism and um, inspire us to action. This service is a cooperative of committed members of BUC. The RJ team invites our church to learn, be involved, and reflect on justice in our community. The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in the areas of environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. The recipient of our plate sharing from July 16th through August 20th is the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. MLCV protects Michigan's air, land, and water by activating voters to elect and hold accountable public officials who fight for an environment that sustains the health and well-being of us all. The impacts of climate change are intensifying and decades of disinvestment have resulted in certain communities disproportionately bearing the brunt of these impacts. By working together, we can reverse these disparities and ensure all Michiganders, regardless of income or zip code, have clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, and healthy communities. I am going to read a uh, small section from Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy. There is a strength, a power even, and understanding brokenness, because embracing our brokenness creates a need and desire for mercy, and perhaps a corresponding need to show mercy. When you experience mercy, you learn things that are hard to learn otherwise. You see things you can't otherwise see. You hear things you can't otherwise hear. You begin to recognize the humanity that resides in each of us. Ushers, please come forward. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service.
I took away the stool, so I hope you can see me. <laughs> we come now to the time in our service set aside for spiritual practices. Today we share an embodied practice. Research indicates that the pressure and stress of the past several years has had an impact on our bodies and on our behaviors. We have faced a lot of trauma and accelerated levels of change. Without enough opportunity to process or integrate what we have experienced. We have added this element to our practice, to our worship services in an effort to use mind-body integration practices to help us feel centered and grounded. Today's practice imagines a stream of light. Please close your eyes or soften your gaze as you feel comfortable. Imagine there is a comforting stream of light coming from above you and moving through the top of your head. Feel this light make its way down to your face, down the back of your neck. Notice it on your shoulders as it flows down your chest, arms, torso, then gradually to your legs and all the way to your feet. Allow this light to slowly flow through your body to wherever you're holding tension. When this light finds that place of tension, imagine that it warms the tight muscles, allowing them to release. Feel the blood come back to that area of your body. Feel the warmth and the healing. Breathe slowly and deeply, feeling the relief the healing light brings. I don't have a gong. This is going to have to do. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we're going to share joys and concerns right now. Um, and the first is a joy from Larry Larson. I've just learned that we have received the extremely generous bequest from the <coughs> estate of Anne Troop. She has been um, a major donor to the DSO and the Detroit Chamber Winds and String for many years as well. And there is a sorrow from Larry Friedman because of uterine cancer, my daughter Emily had a successful hysterectomy last Friday. However, we learned that there was some cancer outside of the uterus and that she will probably need chemo, chemo treatment. Please keep her in your thoughts. And we also hold in our hearts all those sorrows and joys that might be too tender to share at this point. We're going to do a little prayer now. Spirit of life, may we hold in our hearts gratitude 
for those we remember with care and never lose sight of the dignity and worthiness of all who live amongst us. Grant us the willingness to open ourselves anew to this beautiful and wounded world. We ask this in the name of truth, compassion, and justice. Amen. We're going to sing Comfort Me. Equality in a sea of inequality. When this country was founded, the aspiration was high. Men who imagined it dreamed big, casting a vision of a world where all men were created equal, where rights were endowed by our creator, transcending culture and the expectations of the day, where life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness would be allowed and enjoyed without infringement. It was a radical and a new vision, born from the Enlightenment optimism, inspired by scientific discovery. It was an intoxicating vision, as bold as the Protestant Reformation that swept all of Europe. And they had the hubris to believe that they could make it happen. They staked their claim in the Declaration of Independence and institutionalized it in the Constitution. They elected their first president, and when he stepped down, relinquishing power to return to the role of citizen, those founders believed that they lived to see their vision realized. A new president ran for office, and the republic was up and running. It was done, a new world order. Those men weren't distracted by genocide they inspired or the enslavement of other people they required for this nation to be born. They declared equality while swimming in a sea of inequality. When they declared all men were created equal, they meant white Protestant men. They didn't mean women, and they weren't including black people who had been enslaved or those who were free. They didn't include Catholics, Jews, or people who didn't own land. They were proud of their inclusivity, so inspired by their own cutting edge philosophy that they had no idea how narrow it was, how constrictive, how small a vision. The men who wrote those words 
were calling into being a more perfect union. They were establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility, securing the blessings of liberty. They believed that they, the men of their generation, would will this nation into being. They would establish the structures required for such a grand vision. They would test it, and then it would be done. They didn't realize it would require many more people, many different voices. They didn't know how many generations would have to be part of the creation of that dream. How long it would take before the nation they imagined would be manifest. The soul of America has yet to be born.
Hello, I'm going to be presenting on my work as a staff attorney at the Cooley Innocence Project, where I focus on overturning wrongful convictions from Wayne County. So, again, Jess Weber, I'm an attorney. Um, <laughs> I can have the next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit of background um, on what innocence work is. So I work on claims of actual innocence. So that is where a defendant is claiming that they did not commit the crime for which they were convicted. This is a little bit different from claims of possibly like self-defense or insanity when someone says, I committed the crime, but I shouldn't have been convicted. This is when people are saying either like, I wasn't there or maybe I was there, but I didn't participate in the crime. When somebody is exonerated, that means they are relieved of all the consequences of that conviction, following a post-conviction examination of all the evidence. This typically means following somebody's conviction, their appeal, their conviction is confirmed, and then often many years later, a body of an innocence organization looks into all the evidence in their case from police reports to what happened at trial, et cetera, and finds new evidence that they should not have been convicted for the crime. An exoneree is somebody who's been exonerated. Innocence organizations, such as the one I work at, are non-government entities that work to secure exonerations. And then finally, conviction integrity units. That's a relatively new concept, but it's a body within a prosecutor's office that reviews its own prior convictions and recommends relief. So these are very helpful because Normally, it's an adversarial process where innocence organizations are filing motions in court and the prosecutor's office is saying, no, this person should have been convicted. But now with conviction integrity units, both the prosecutors and defense attorneys are saying that somebody was wrongfully convicted and they should be exonerated. So a little bit about my background. So I grew up in BUC from when I was an infant through high school, so I participated in RE. Um, I attended cons and I did social justice projects. After graduating, I attended the University of Michigan where I, I studied environmental policy and law justice and social change. And this is when I was first exposed to criminal justice reform. I interned at the Washtenaw County Office of Public Defender and this inspired me to attend law school. So in law school, I was able to learn about exoneration work, wrongful conviction work, through the Exoneration Justice Project, where I was able to work as a law student attorney on cases of actual innocence. And this is also when I was exposed to conviction integrity units. In particular, I interned at the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, CIU, and that helped me get a job at the Cooley Innocence Project following um, my graduation. So I always think it's best um, to give some examples. So one of my good friends, Ken Nixon, he was exonerated in February of 2021 with the help of the Conviction um, Integrity Unit in Wayne County and the Cooley Innocence Project. He served almost um, 15 years in prison for a homicide and arson that he did not commit, in which multiple people um, kill, were killed and other people were injured in a home. And there were multiple causes of wrongful conviction, which I'll discuss after this, that contributed to his, his conviction. So one was a misidentification. Another was testimony of a jailhouse informant. And this is somebody who is facing their own con, um, criminal charges who provides false testimony against somebody else in exchange for a deal in their own case. And then also false forensics. In Ken's case, a police dog falsely alerted to the presence of accelerants, which connected him to throwing the Molotov cocktail. So causes of wrongful conviction. So as I just stated, there's mistaken witness identification, perjury or false accusations, false or misleading forensic evidence. And then there's also false confessions where the police coerce somebody into confessing to a crime that they did not commit and official misconduct by the police or prosecutor's office. And this is typically when the police or prosecutors fail to disclose evidence that might exonerate or show that somebody is innocent to the defense prior to trial. So 
So since this is the Racial Justice Committee, figured I would talk about the intersection of race and wrongful convictions. So in America, black Americans make up 13% of the US population, <clears throat> but black Americans make up 47, or defendants make up 40%, 47% of known exonerations. And this also kind of <clears throat> reflects the trend of general um, over criminalization of black Americans. So with some specific offenses, in murder cases, which is the largest category of cases that I work on, black people are seven times more likely to be wrongfully convicted. In sexual assault cases, black prisoners serving time for sexual assaults, sexual assaults are 3.5 times more likely to be innocent. And one of the largest causes of that is cross-racial misidentifications. And then in drug cases, Innocent black Americans are 12 times more likely to be convicted of possession than innocent white people. But just to give an idea of how prevalent this issue is in the United States, since 1989, there have been almost 3,500 exonerations with almost 32,000 years lost where, of time that people should not have been in prison, in which they were, with an average of nine years lost per case. Michigan is one of the states with the most wrongful convictions in the country. Most of those do come from Wayne County. In Michigan, there have been 176 exonerations since 1989, with 1,800 years lost and 10 years average per case. And these graphs and all the um, images I showed before are from the National Registry of Exonerations, which you can look around and see more about the different causes that contribute to exonerations by state, et cetera. So I'd recommend you do that. So regarding the intersection of this work in Unitarian Universalism, there is a, a quote that Martin Luther King Jr. stated, which gained a lot of popularity during the civil rights movement and President Obama echoed during his presidency, which is, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And the actual long quote is from a Unitarian preacher from the 1850s, which I think is cool. It is, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches, but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends towards justice. The relation to UU principles, I believe this work relates to three in particular. The first principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every person, regardless of race, zip code, or prior, <clears throat> excuse me, prior criminal history that might connect somebody to a current ongoing case. The second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. Nobody deserves to be convicted for a crime which they did not commit and the sixth principle, which is the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Luckily, the innocence movement is growing, and the more it grows, the more people are likely to be exonerated. So finally, I have some calls to action, ways you can support this work. And of course, come talk to me afterwards and I can tell you more about it. Um, one is monetary support. You can support organizations like where I work, the Cooley Innocence Project or the National Innocence Project, or a number of others. You could donate to the Organization of Exonerees. Uh, the aforementioned exoneree, Ken Nixon, actually founded the Organization of Exonerees along with some other exonerees in Michigan to provide reentry support for other exonerees returning to the community. And it's exoneree founded and led. So that's a really awesome organization in Michigan. And they're having their second annual gala in October if you're interested in attending. And then the other thing you can do is vote. So you can elect progressive prosecutors that are likely to found conviction integrity units or keep them going within their offices. In Michigan, there's five right now. There's the Attorney General's Office, Wayne County, Oakland, Macomb, and Washtenaw County. But there are so many other counties in the state of Michigan that don't have CIUs right now that could definitely use them. And you can support state legislators that are focused on criminal justice reform. Right now, there are two bills that are currently pending. One, which gives prisoners the access to 
their own court records. Currently, prisoners are not allowed to file Freedom of Information Act requests of their own records. Um, so they need somebody on the outside to file a FOIA request on their behalf, which is crazy. And then there's also amendments to the post-conviction DNA testing statute, which broadens the ability for people who are wrongfully convicted to get testing done. So thank you so much, and I look forward to talking to you guys more about this later. Can we now stand as we're willing and able and sing our closing hymn, We'll Build a Land. Verses one, two, and four. This is our calling. The world aches for us to join together and bring about healing for justice and to produce ever increasing ye love. This is our calling. It is to go forth and to act accordingly. 
Amen. Thank you.